in the connection that the tribe has with the Spokane River, being a river people that uh, looking to the river to feed it, to feed the Spokane people for the last 10,000 years or since time immemorial, it came in different fashions, most of which was the salmon. And if you look out the historical documents, not just tribal oral traditional statements or information in our history, if you look at the earliest journals of when the fur traders arrived in 1810 and built Spokane House, from that time forward, if it was missionaries, if it was botanists, if it was scientists, or if it was uh, newspaper publishers, they all bear witness to the, the amount of salmon that used to return from this ocean every year. And they'd say a band of 100 or 150 would grow to 1,000 or 1,500 because the number of people that came to get their share of the fish. And the share of fish would be lined on the banks of the river. So at Spokane House or just at Hainman Creek or just below the city of Spokane, you would see two, three, some places, 5,000 fish drying on the banks, being prepared for those people to take home to provide a year's supply of fish. The salmon chief always being in charge, making sure everybody shared in that fish, in that fishery equally. And so over time that became a part of us, that was built into our culture, into our traditions. It became a part of us in our songs, in our ceremony. And so that was, the river was part of us through that avenue. Um, and so being a river people, the Spokane tribe is a river people, that relationship between the Spokane River and the Spokane tribe cannot ever be separated. No matter what happens, it'll always be there. And so that's why we fight so hard to keep the Spokane River clean, to keep it, to get the Spokane River as back or as close to nature intended as we possibly can. Well, in the early days, the Spokane River uh, was pristine, a beautiful river, uh, really worthy of a national park. You imagine, think of how beautiful it is today. Uh, think of it with no buildings at all around. Uh, but as soon as European Americans began to settle in the 1870s, James Glover came and built up a city, uh, you had pollution, first human waste, and then the sawmills. And that was an attraction financially to build sawmills. But early on, the river was so pristine that it was a, uh, a wonderful fishing ground. And people came from throughout the West to Spokane just to fish. It was a wild, wild river with wild fish. Uh, but people began to discover that the trout, something was wrong with the trout. They were getting sick. And it didn't take too much science to figure out what was wrong because you could look at the gills of the fish and you could look upstream and see there's the, there's the sawmill 100 or 200 yards upstream and there are, are uh, flakes of, of, uh, of, of sawmill waste in the gills of the fish. So they knew that was something wrong. And for a short period of time, the town was so involved in the, in the, uh, in the outdoor sports that that was part of the economy of the town and they were able to shut down the mills. But as time went by, they became, the economic argument for them became stronger and stronger and they opened them up again. And then from there you had other industries and for the next 50, 60, 70 years, it was pretty much go, go, go for various industries, putting various kinds of pollutants into the river. Up to the 1950s, there was not even any sewage treatment at all. There were sewage pipes but everything, raw sewage went right into the river. It was only in the 60s, 70s, 80s, up to today, that they began to uh, clean up the river with treatment plants and, and so on. But it was a long battle, and for many years after the first founding of the, the town of Spokane, uh, it was basically from one level of pollution to another getting worse and worse. The rumor was, the idea was, the, a river would take care of itself every five miles, it would clean itself up. But of course that was not true at all. The river isn't what it once was. I remember uh, going down the Spokane River 
when my my two uh, daughters and they were they're now in their 40s their mid 40s and we went down to the river and I saw this white thing floating by and I looked it was a, it was a dead fish and I took my feet out of the, the river and it had all this oily substance on my legs <laughs> and I looked at my kids and I said get out of the water and they they were kind of uh, stunned and startled and I said get out get out and, and I pointed and I said you see that and then there was another one going by and it was trout they were bellied up and they were floating by and that was uh, 40 years ago plus the Spokane tribe of Indians applied for treatment as a state under the Clean Water Act I was part of the legal team that put that application together since the establishment of our reservation, our tribal leaders recognized the importance of clean water to our people. In Twet Nihwilhutin, the river gives us our way of life. Our boundaries include the Shimakin Creek, the Spokane River, and the Columbia River. The Spokane tribe applied for treatment as a state in the United States Congress by enacting Section 518 under the Clean Water Act expressly delegated to tribal governments regulatory authority over water management programs. The Spokane Tribe's application was approved and we set our water quality standards. The Spokane Tribe recognized that there were significant contamination issues on our reservation waterways. There were people and entities dumping pollutants into the Spokane River. They were driving roadways over the Shimakin Creek they were dumping garbage and diverting water, essentially disrupting the natural water flow. The Spokane Tribe of Indians is simply fighting for clean water. Clean water is good for everyone. Clean water is good for our communities today, and clean water is good for future generations. The Spokane Tribe developed its own water quality standards to protect the culture and lifeways of its members. That included a fish consumption rate that was much higher than that of the average Washington citizen. Historically, the Spokane tribe ate a significant amount of fish, an average of more than 865 grams, or two pounds of salmon a day. We subsist on salmon, and nearly 60% of the diet of our ancestors was Chinook salmon. In fact, the Spokane tribe once harvested 150,000 Chinook salmon a season from the Spokane River. Because of this, we needed a water quality standard for toxins like PCBs that would protect those uses of catching and eating fish. Our water quality standards is very protective. It is only 1.3 parts per quadrillion, much more protective than the standards for the state of Washington. This makes sure that our tribe can be protected and continue our cultural heritage of catching and eating fish. One day salmon will again swim our waters and we need them to be clean. The law says that those upstream are obligated to protect downstream water quality standards. So while the Washington State standard might allow PCB discharges at 170 parts per quadrillion, the law demands that upstream dischargers meet the Spokane Tribal standard of 1.3 parts per quadrillion for PCBs. Any kind of variance would only serve to slow down the momentum of getting our rivers safe to eat our fish again and is inconsistent with the requirements of the Clean Water Act. Mm, we're, bringing, we're bringing stuff back. Uh, our canoe culture is bringing not only our people back, but our ways back. And also awareness. It's uh, having people ask, who, who are we? What do we do? What do we believe in? And getting salmon home. That's, that's the main goal. Because it is a part of our life. It's balancing everything. And so it was a way of life. It was our way of life. But now the Spokane River is just totally different. It's giant, it's really wide, and it does not provide the life that it once has. It's been dammed up so many different areas that it's just cut off life. And it's taken away life too, these dams. that took away many of our, our burial spots and our camping spots that are now flooded. And so we go back to the river 
and we have this joy and we, we love paddling, um, but it's bittersweet because I know my ancestors are below me, still sleeping. And when that dam, when it releases the water, it fluctuates and it plays with the soil. And oftentimes we gotta rebury our people. A lot of us, we just felt disconnected. For me personally, I felt very disconnected. Um, but learning our language and going back to our culture, canoe culture, going back to the water it saves us. I mean, there's parts in the river now where uh, we can't fish. Uh, we, they say they don't recommend you eat more than one, two fish from the rivers. And for us as river people, I want to go out and fish every day. I want to eat hundreds of fish a month. Living at one with this earth, not truly manipulating it or hurting it, but being able to take care of it and share with it and prosper. We want a healthy balance of life from not just ourselves, but for all animals. And I think getting salmon back home feeds us, feeds the land, feeds our bears, feeds our sky animals, it helps our trees. Salmon, that's like our blood. Um, and, but anyway, this year, 2020, we've already had um, three fish um, come back. One made it all the way through, because when they go through Bonneville Dam, they almost have to go by the counter and they have a pit tag in them. So they're getting, they're coming by and they're pinging. They show up on the database in the Pitagia system and says, oh, there's our tag. And we get an email saying, oh, one of your fish just came by our, come by our reader. Uh, the Coeur d'Alene, Spokane's, uh, the Colvilles are all working to, to try to release salmon, to, to watch them, to, to give them the opportunity to out-migrate. And, and we've shown that, you know, in the last few years, they go out well. We, we were thinking like Roosevelt because it's 150 miles long, it's a reservoir, that would be a, a, a barrier for those fish to come out. Um, we have a lot of reservoirs, and reservoirs flooded the spawning habitat, a lot of spawning habitat for those fish. So we may have to look into those tributaries and say, hey, how can we maximize those tributaries for spawning? Maybe like the, the Shimakin or the Little Spokane in the Spokane River. And, the, and below the falls, there's still, I mean, if big rainbows spawn in there, then salmon can spawn in there. Um, and like I said, and there's really high survival for rainbow trout eggs in the gravels below Spokane. So they're fairly clean. Um, a lot of people think that, oh, they really go through the turbines. Yeah, the little fish go through the turbines. They go through the spillways. Um, and their survival is really pretty good. But what happens when you add up every dam, and each dam takes up maybe 4 to 5% of the run, by the time you add them all up, by the, what you're getting out in the ocean, such a small number, and then what you get in return is even smaller. And so it's each one of those all together takes a pretty good impact. But each one on its own, if you only had one dam to go through, you'd be like, well, wow, we, won't, we still have 96% going through. But it's when if everyone's going to take 5%, what we have left to hit to the ocean, we have to release large numbers in order to have a, a sizable return come back. So.